Okay, so here we are, a chapter 12 lecture. So we're going to talk about forests, forest management, and protected areas. These are our goals, um, our objectives for the chapter. Um, we're going to look at timber management, deforestation, forest management, um, and talk a little bit about the different um, types of protected land that we have. Uh, we're going to talk about this. One thing that happens if we had paper textbooks um, is that publishing companies and any companies that produce paper products, so tissues, toilet paper, paper bags, anything like that, um, they can have their processes analyzed by a third party comp third party organization and um, get certified that their whole process is sustainable. Um, that's uh, a good thing. You know, a lot of, a lot of people will buy products that have some indication of sustainability. So it is definitely, um, a marketing plus. So this is what, um, if you're going to be FS cert FSC certified, uh, forest stewardship council, um, I'll show you a couple things that, uh, that I have that are FSC certified. Um, those are the things that you have to do. Okay, so you have to be careful in everything from, you know, planting and caring for your timber and your forests to harvesting and um, transporting your material. So it's a big deal. So here's our Captain Obvious statement. A forest is an ecosystem with a lot of trees. <laughs> Fabulous. If we go back to um, chapter four. We talked about all the different biomes. There's a whole bunch of um, forest biomes and uh, they're listed there and you can see pictures. So Maple Beach Birch in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, where we are, as is the same in West Virginia, we are in an oak hickory forest. So the biome, the name of the forest biome is typically uh, connected to the name of the most common trees. So if you go out in our woods, typically you see oaks and hickories. These are our climax communities. Okay. Ponderosa pine, redwood forest, um, all that kind of stuff. So differences in soil and climate is going to change the community. So you're going to have different plants um, based on soil chemistry and uh, the amount of precipitation and temperature. And like I said, the forest types are based on their predominant tree species. About a third of the earth, a little less than a third of the earth is covered in forest. So um, in terms of ecology, forests are complex. Um, they've got a whole bunch of different levels. So the canopy is the very, very tallest part, um, the upper parts of the leaves, the top. Uh, the sub canopy is the middle, the understory where it's really shaded um, is the, the lower part. And then the forest floor contains ground cover plants. Um, you can have dead and dying trees. They're called snags. Um, we actually had a bunch in my front yard, but in November or December, we had somebody come and take them down. Um, they were kind of cool because they had um, um, pileated woodpecker holes in them. So it was good for the pileated woodpeckers, but it wasn't good for the power lines. Um, if we had a really good windstorm or snowstorm, those trees would have come down. And a lot of them were also um, hit by the emerald ash borer. So we had to get rid of them. So where those trees were taken down, it creates a tree fall gap. So I'm interested to see what happens when, um, you know, the spring comes back, what kind of growth we get under there where um, there was no tree before. Ecosystem services. This is a really good image, right? Because one thing that they're going to talk about on the AP test is connecting these things to ecosystem services. E everything. How, how does this particular biome, what are ecosystem services provided by this or whatever? So take a screenshot of this. Um, I'll actually put this lecture in Canvas anyway for you guys. So that way <coughs> you can take a look at it. So it hits a lot of our um, different kinds of ecosystem services, supporting, um, regulating, et cetera. So make sure you know what those are. Some people refer to the um, trees as the lungs of the planet. 
uh, and they kind of are because they um, take in carbon dioxide and they put oxygen out for us. So not only do they provide ecosystem services, they provide resources. So we get a lot of medicine, uh, dye, you know, um, plants, food sources. And also um, it's a source of income for places like Canada and Russia with their boreal forests, which is where a lot of our lumber comes from, or the rainforests like Brazil or Indonesia. So we have these fabulous forests, but we're getting rid of them. And the process is deforestation. Deforestation is the clearing of forests more quickly than they can grow. So if you get rid of forests, right, if you chop down trees, you're going to lose biodiversity because of all of the complexities within the um, forest structure. Soil is going to degrade <clears throat> because there's no um, organic matter decomposing like leaf litter and stuff that goes into the soil. Um, and eventually, because there are no roots to hold the soil down, um, it can turn into a desert. And that process is desertification, which is a major, major issue. And it can contribute to climate change. So if you think about it, right, carbon dioxide is, is one of the gases that's contributing to climate change. So if we're cutting down trees, we are removing that, that sponge that sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Not only are we putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from an anthropogenic standpoint, we are removing mass quantities of the organisms that pull that carbon dioxide out. Okay. So um, that's going to definitely contribute to climate change. So we're losing lots of uh, acres of forest. And that's what this little statistic says. So this is kind of crazy. Um, we've deforested much of North America um, in one of the chapters that we didn't, we didn't cover this part, the policy chapter, which is chapter seven. Um, we had this philosophy, the manifest destiny philosophy, where, you know, the, the, the nature was here for humans to conquer. So we did, and we chopped down big giant trees and we burned them for wood, for fuel and heated our homes and built our log cabins. Um, and then, um, you know, we plowed the fields and, you know, we conquered the land. And in 1620 on the left in the picture here, that's what it looked like. But we have cut a lot of that primary forest away, right? And we're going to talk about why that's an issue. So in some cases, um, we've realized, oh, you know what? <laughs> hmm. We don't want as much crop land or flat land. We want our forests. So we've allowed um, forests to grow back and that's the secondary forest. So the only, um, let me zoom in here a little bit. So the only, um, most of the primary forest that you see is like the Pacific Northwest on the western side of the Mississippi River. Okay, some um, in Colorado and Wyoming and a lot of Idaho is still primary forest. But if you compare it to what it was, it's definitely not a lot um, compared to what it was. Okay, there we go. So primary forest is uncut, hasn't been touched. A secondary forest um, is different, you know, in terms of species structure, composition, nutrient balance. So it's not what was there originally, but it's, you know, the best we can do. Um, for the most part, deforestation is happening faster in um, developing nations, okay? And it kind of makes sense why. Um, people need to expand. They want to expand human settlement. They want fuel for cooking and heating their homes um, to boost economic growth so they have space to, to grow economically and move in that demographic transition. Um, so they want space to do it. And that their philosophy is that the easiest thing to do is to just chop down the trees. Who needs trees? Um, and that industrial technology, the, the, the harvesting and lumber industry, that more advanced technologies are making their way to these developing countries. So it's happening even faster. Um, so the red is forest loss. And we're going to talk about why um, Latin America and Indonesia are so high. We can talk about that in a couple minutes. Um, those are developed slash 
sort of like on the later end of developing nations. Um, Africa is losing its forests so quickly because um, of that development that I had talked about in the previous slide. And in some cases, um, we are regrowing forests in a lot of areas of the world, uh, in the United States and lots of places in Europe. Um, they're counting China as um, gaining a lot of forest, but it's not natural forest. It's what they call monoculture. It's all one species. So it's these big, vast plantations of the same species of, of um, plants. Okay. So yes, their um, forest is expanding, but it's not expanding in a natural way. It's um, in a, in a man-made way. So here's a good example, right? Um, Brazil, 1975 on the left, same area in 2001. Um, Brazil is deforesting rapidly because of um, soybean farming. So they're clearing the forests to uh, grow soybeans and they're clearing the forests for uh, cattle grazing. So because soy and beef are two um, foods that are in high demand, um, the Brazilian people and other nations um, think that let's just, we don't need the forest, we want the money. So let's clear. And they're not, and they're not seeing the forest for the trees. You're, you know, they're missing the forest for the trees. So they're looking short term rather than, than long term consequences. But, you know, people are going to make the best, and I've said this before, people are going to make the best decisions under the circumstances. And when you have a choice between having an option to feed your family, and having this beautiful, well-preserved rainforest, you know, you're going to make the choice that allows you to feed your family. Um, so there are equity issues with that too, which we can talk about. This is what's going on in Borneo. Um, this is so sad. Um, palm oil is a huge commodity now. Um, if you pull up any of your like granola bars or any cosmetics, um, they have palm oil in them. And we can talk about why palm oil is such a commodity in our um, post-lecture conversation. But what they're doing is they're, they're destroying huge swaths of natural rainforest. Uh, Borneo 1950 is on the left, okay? And they're clearing it for palm oil plantations. So it's a monoculture single crop because palm oil is in such high demand. Okay. Um, and no, this isn't, you guys didn't choose this case study. Um, so we'll talk about that in class. Um, when, you know, it, again, it's a, it's a financial, um, choice to choose to take your land and clear it and plant palm rather than leaving it as natural rainforest. And there are lots of consequences of that that we'll talk about um, when we talk about the, the chapter. But there's a great picture of it. We understand this, right? When the forest is cut down or burned or decomposed, that carbon dioxide that was in its tissue um, gets released back up into the atmosphere. And then there's also less vegetation to soak it back up. So that is... Um, uh, positive feedback loop, which we don't like. So we can manage forests. I had a couple students two years ago who left high school and wanted to go into forest management. So they were forestry majors. Um, they manage the demands for forests against uh, maintaining them as ecosystems. So it's, it's for, if you're going to major in forestry, you're going to find that balance between natural ecosystems and, um, human use. And we know that timber is renewable as long as it's not exploited too quickly. It takes time for trees to grow to maturity. Um, we can manage resources and we do it overall <coughs> through all of our, um, renewable resources. Um, how we can manage and regulate harvest, right? So as to um, allow us to get the benefit of that resource without over overusing it, exploiting it. So what they find is something called maximum sustainable yield, okay? Based, it's different from what any one species to the next. So you want to ex you want to get the maximum amount of resource out of 
whatever you're trying to get, in this case, a forest, without depleting the resource. So how can you, where is that, okay? Um, if we think about, if it's a logistic growth curve, right? Like you can see there, it's usually about halfway, all right? So you harvest it when it's at its point of fastest growth, right? The maximum of exponential growth. So it will grow back faster and faster and faster, okay? If you harvest too soon or too late, the growth is slow, okay? So you're gonna get your maximum yield out of it, but it's gonna be a sustainable yield, which means it will keep giving and giving and giving and giving. The downside to that is that your population doesn't grow to its carrying capacity. It only grows to about half its normal size, but you're able to get the maximum yield out of it, but still remain sustainable. So that way your renewable resource is gonna continue. Um, another thing that you can do is something called ecosystem-based management. So you try to do your maximum sustainable yield, but not everywhere to kind of keep everything um, in balance. And it's difficult to do because um, ecosystems are really complex and interrelated and you can't always predict what's gonna come uh, from a human change in an ecosystem. And we can skip adaptive management. So um, we started setting up national forests, okay, as deforestation back in the 1800s started to give, to give rise to um, fears of a timber famine, like we're gonna run out of trees and timber. So there are uh, five different agencies that manage federal lands. And I'm gonna zoom in here so we can take a look. So we've got the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is that greenish color, the, yeah, army green, olive green, the Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, and the National Park Service. So all of them have their hands in the management of federal lands, some of which are forested, okay? So they all have different jurisdictions and manage different lands. A lot of that in Alaska, um, most of the land in Alaska is federally managed rather than privately owned. And because you can see most of Alaska is covered. And a lot of the lands in the West are that way, more so than the lands here um, in, uh, on the East Coast, which causes issues for people that live out there. And we're gonna talk about it. If we don't talk about it now, we'll talk about it in, um, in our lecture. So, we take timber from private land and from public land. So we have the opportunity through permitting, so we don't hit the tragedy of the commons, to um, harvest timber from public forests, pr pr public lands. But most of it takes place on private lands, as you can see in the, in the picture. Um, so timber, if you harvest timber um, on public lands, they uh, sell the timber below what it costs. So we wind up, taxpayers have to subsidize private timber harvesting on public land. So taxpayers pay for it, which some people have an issue with. Um, and we've been pretty stable in the United States and other developed countries, but it's getting worse, like I'd said, in developing countries. Okay, so when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, it blasted everything flat. Um, and the forest management service out there, um, and the Weyerhaeuser paper company owned a lot of the land in the Gifford Pinchot national forest or harvested, had the rights to harvest a lot of the land in Gifford around Mount St. Helens and Gifford Pinchot national forest. So what they did is, um, afterwards, because, you know, the employees had nothing to do because everything was knocked flat. And I'll show you guys some pictures. Um, they, uh, went and hand planted like 2 million um, seedlings, 2 million tree seedlings. And I'll show you pictures from when I was out there. You walk, you you drive into Mount St. Helens, towards Mount St. Helens, and you see all of this green, lush tree, all of these trees. And you see signs, Weyerhaeuser Paper Company, and it gives you the name of the tree in the year that it was planted. And then there's another sign a couple miles down the road Weyerhaeuser Paper Company, the kind of tree, and then the year it was planted. 
So um, all of those trees in that area are the same age, okay? They call those trees even-aged trees, all right, because they're all the same age. Um, and all of the trees that I saw were some species of fir. I forget what kind it was. So it's all one species all around the same age. That's called even-aged monoculture. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of biodiversity, um, doesn't, isn't as complex, so it doesn't offer as much space and habitat for organisms as a regular forest does. And it's really vulnerable to pest insects. Um, you know, if it was all ash, the emerald ash borer could get out there and then just destroy everything. Um, a natural forest is uneven aged. So you have a bunch of different ages of trees, which gives you that structural diversity and better habitat um, rather than a managed forest. So that's kind of what we want to go for. So how do we cut timber? One of the, e the easiest way, the cheapest way is uh, something called clear cutting and this kind of stuff you have to know. So clear cutting is exactly what it says. You go in with equipment and you just clear this swath, right? You just cut this strip and cut down every single tree regardless of age. You're stripping the vegetation, which is going to increase erosion. You are going to um, have a greater chance of that soil because, you know, the sun is penetrating down. The soil is going to dry out. You could have desertification. Uh, evaporation is a lot higher because there's no tree cover um, and no transpiration of the plants. So this is definitely not the way to go in, from an ecological environmental standpoint. From an economic standpoint, it's totally the way to go because it's cheap and you just get everything that you want to get. Um, a couple other systems are a seed tree approach, right? Where you have, um, it, it's a selective cutting is what it amounts to. So you can, um, the seed tree approach is where you leave some reproducing trees in the area to go ahead and reseed so you don't have to do it. Um, the shelter wood approach leaves big trees behind to shelter the seedlings that are growing. Um, and you do those kinds of approaches through selection systems where you pick and choose what trees to take. You take the most mature trees. The down, so from an ecological environmental standpoint, that's much better, but it's going to cost more money because you can't just take a machine in and just gobble up all the trees or just cut them down and push them behind you. Um, you have to pick and choose, which is much more expensive because it takes more time. And it's also more dangerous for the actual loggers that are doing it because if a tree doesn't come down right, you know, if, if a tree that's coming down hits a tree that wasn't supposed to come down, it's a lot more dangerous and a lot more risky, but it's environmentally better. So, you know, lumber companies have to do a cost benefit analysis for that. And then this is just a picture of those things. Let me pop out a little bit. There you go. So the original forest, if you clear cut, they're all going to um, come back at the same age. Seed tree and shelter wood, you leave a big tree behind and then it kind of provides um, shelter for um, the seedlings that come. And a selection system, you pick and choose your trees and then other trees grow in their place, depending on species. So... The Forest Service has found um, that forests, the way they, you can use a national forest, uh, it's multiple use so that they can be used for recreation, for wildlife habitat, f and mineral extraction and other things in addition to timber, okay? So every national forest, as a result of the National Forest Management Act, which you, this is not a piece of legislation you need to know, um, says that you have to draw up way, a renewable resource management plan for every national forest. So if we go back to that picture, um, you know, every national forest has its own plan based on the resources that are there. Um, so we can um, manage wildlife, endangered species that are in these forests. Um, so nesting birds for, you know, if there's, uh, a, an endangered bird that nests in a particular forest, um, that tree would be marked so everybody would know that that's not a tree that you can take down because um, it endangers another resource. Um, 
in an, in a concept called new forestry, um, they tend to, they try to mimic natural disturbances to kind of allow, um, um, nature to take its course without having to take its course to allow a, a forest to develop in a more natural way. Whoops. Sorry. Um, so this is, this is the irony of, um, politics and how it gets involved in, um, programs and, and policies like this. So Bill Clinton in 2001 came up with this thing called a roadless rule that placed, um, basically said that a third of the national forests you can't construct roads. Okay, no problem. 2005, Bush comes in and says, we're not going to let you, we're not going to federally mandate that. States can decide whether they want to um, manage or allow roads to be built into their national forests. Okay. Obama comes in and says, no, the roadless rule is going to come back. Nobody can do it. My guess is, I don't know if, if Trump has had gotten into this or not. Trump probably either repealed the roadless rule altogether or went back to, um, you know, Bush's way of thinking. And who knows what's going to happen in Jan later this month and down the line when Biden comes in. But my guess is that the roadless rule will come back. So this is the frustrating thing um, from an environmental standpoint, depending on who's making the policy will determine whether the environment is a high priority issue or not. Um, so it's just very frustrating to me as a person who um, clearly cares about the environment and wants to see sustainability and preservation for you guys and your kids and your grandkids. So this is another um, big thing that we talk about um, when we talk about forest management. It's the idea of fires. And if you think about the concept of a forest fire, you think devastation and it's awful and it's so bad. Um, and it really isn't. Um, for the Forest Service for a really long time, suppressed fire whenever it broke out. So fire, boom, it's out, no big deal. But we've learned a lot since the Forest Service um, came into existence. And we know that fire is an important part of forest ecology, okay? And we're gonna talk about why. So what we've noticed is that when we've suppressed fires, when we've put fires out as soon as they've started, fires get bigger, right? And we're going to talk about why. Um, a re one big reason why fires are so devastating is not because of what it does to the forest itself. It's because a lot of human development is right up against those forests, right? So the, fo the fires in California, they're a natural part of the chaparral biome, periodic fires. But the problem is not the damage to the forest, it's the damage to the property. Okay. So one thing that we've done is um, to reduce fuel loads. We've protected, protect property and improve conditions. What they do is something called a prescribed burn. They go out and intentionally set small fires to burn this stuff that you see under here, the underbrush, trees that have fallen down, that kind of thing. Okay. So fires are not a bad thing. Um, small fires are not a bad thing. Set in, intentionally set small fires are not a bad thing. It helps to reduce the, the size of the big fires. And we'll talk about um, some of that stuff when we get together and discuss this. Okay, something else they're doing um, is salvage logging. So when a storm comes through, um, they'll go in and take out any of the trees that have fallen to reduce that fuel load to allow um, fires when they burn like out in California not to be so massive. Um, climate change is, uh, changing forests. And when that changes, um, you know, a lot of other things change. So, um, conditions are warmer and drier in the West and the West is prone to forest fires to begin with. So if it gets warmer and drier, your risk of fire is increasing. Um, and there are lots of, um, pests like the pine bark beetle. Um, 
because the temperatures are getting warmer, they don't really die. So they can spread a lot faster, which is an issue. Okay. And if they kill a whole bunch of trees, you know, these pests kill a whole bunch of trees. Now you've got all of this fuel primed and ready to burn um, in these warmer and drier conditions, which is definitely not a good thing. So that's kind of what I just talked about. Um, and because a lot of them are even aged um, forests that were um, planted intentionally, you're going to wind up um, with even more food for these beetles. So it's, it, again, it's a, a positive feedback loop that's just going to get worse and worse and worse, which is not good. So this is the idea of sustainable forestry, the Forest Stewardship Council, which I had talked about. Um, you know, you might have seen this logo. I'll, I'll pull up some pictures of stuff um, that I actually have. Maybe I'll just show them that have that logo. Um, and it's a big deal, you know, to a lot of people who are in the lumber, timber, paper industry. It's a symbol to us as consumers that these guys are trying to do something right. So we're going to talk about parks and protected areas. All right. So we had the first national parks in the world. Um, this is close to the top of my bucket list, Crater Lake National Park. Um, just because I, I just want to sit there. I, I saw the Grand Canyon for the first time um, after I had graduated from college. Um, I was out in Utah doing a my geology field camp and I was you know, three hours, two hours, three hours away from the Grand Canyon. And I was not going to be that close and not go. So I rented a van and took a couple of my friends and we saw the Grand Canyon. And I sat at a benchmark 8,800 feet above sea level on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And I cried um, because I'm a nerd. But it was just the most breathtaking thing I had ever seen um, in my 22 years at that point. Um, so they were set up national parks were set up to preserve the West. And if you go back to that picture where it showed where the land was, most of them are in the West um, because that's where we were expanding quickly. Um, the president can declare selected public lands as national monument, like Mount St. Helens isn't a national park, it's a national monument. So um, there's oodles of them all over the place arches, Great Smoky Mountains, that kind of thing. The National Park Service was created in 1916 um, and it administers the over 400 parks and monuments that exist. Um, another protected area is a National Wildlife Refuge. Okay, uh, The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service manages those. You, um, you can hunt, you can fish, non-commercial, so private. Um, you can take pictures, environmental education, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I believe Sandy Hook is a national wildlife refuge. Possibly. I'll check that out and we'll talk about it. A wilderness area, okay, is, um, you can't develop it. So you can't put, um, buildings and bathrooms and all that stuff, but you can access it, right? So you can um, hike, you can um, kayak like that guy's doing, all right? But you can't like put paved roads and all that stuff in there. Um, a lot of people are not fans of that. Um, so when when we set up the national park system, a lot of the states in the West were not states. Um, so when they became states, the go the federal government still kept control over a lot of their acreage. And we talked about that when we looked at that picture. Idaho, Oregon, and Utah control less than half of their own land, uh, which is aggravating. Um, and because they are national parks and federally owned land, the federal government has the right to say what they can do with them. Um, some states want control over that land to allow them to be used for resource extraction. Um, but that hasn't happened yet. And a lot of indigenous folks can, um, you know, some of these sites have value uh, for indigenous people. So Devil's Tower in um, Wyoming is um, a native, you know, 
blessed site. It's it's a very important site in Native American culture out in Wyoming. Um, so they don't want people climbing it, but, you know, people climb it. Um, there are also land trusts, okay? Um, the Hunterdon Land Trust, we have <coughs> a land trust in Hunterdon County um, based at um, the DeVore Farm in Flemington, right on the circle, um, where they purchase land for preservation. So they have a bunch of preserves around the county. Um, and they're getting bigger, right? Because as we see the value in biodiversity and all of the ecosystem services that these uh, ecosystem, this land can provide, um, we're realizing, hey, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't chop all that down. Maybe we need to um, do something about it. Um, it's harder in a developing country because they don't have the funding or the support, like we talked about when we talked about the Serengeti, the road through the Serengeti. Um, the UN has established protective, uh, protected areas, they call them biosphere reserves, um, that are like super duper special to people. And then they set limits on how the land can be used. The UN also has World Heritage Sites, um, which have cultural or national value, and it covers more than one country. So um, the Mountain Gorilla Reserve covers a whole bunch of countries in Africa. Um, so we have these developing countries who want to just destroy their land, destroy their forest, because and alter their natural ecosystems because it's going to have an economic benefit. So we can look at them and say, no, 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 as a developed country, no, 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 that's not good. It's not going to, you know, be good for you in the long run. And they look at us and say, no way, you did it. We're going to do it too. So what can we do? right? It, we can't be do as I say, not as I do, although we're trying to be. How can we support these countries to give them some economic incentive, a greater economic incentive to protect their land rather than destroy it? And one thing, some conservation organizations can uh, create a debt for nature swap, where the organization is going to raise money to pay off a developing nation's debt, so they don't need that income as much, in exchange for setting land aside as reserves. So we did it. In the United States, we forgave $30 million in debt to Indonesia to preserve forested areas that are home to the Sumatran tiger. So we want to protect this tiger and its habitat and the ecosystem. So we'll forgive you some debt, okay? And that's one thing that we do. It's, it's really, really common uh, as a mechanism to give developing nations an incentive to preserve um, their natural habitats. Um, habitat fragmentation, we've talked about this, um, makes preserves more vital, way more important. Um, so instead of having big swaths of habitat, we have little disconnected ones. And you can see, right, you've got a road coming through here in British Columbia. And you have what the forests should have looked like, but at some point, this all this whole picture would have been big, wide forest like this. So the habitat is fragmented, which is going to make it make life difficult for the keystone species in this habitat, um, which we talked about. And um, other organisms can um, experience something called the edge effect. So if the, they're on the edge of a fragment of habitat rather than on the inside. They've got to deal with different predators, different parasites um, along that edge than they would on the interior, okay? So um, that can cause some long-term issues for those species. Uh, this is definitely something we're going to talk about a little bit more because um, this is a big idea that the College Board likes. It's the idea of island biogeography talks about how the number of species on an island is the result of a balance between immigration and extirpation. So the um, theory talks about the uh, an island species richness based on the distance from the mainland and its size. So typically if it's bigger, 
it's going to have more biodiversity. Okay, so the farther it is from a continent, the fewer species colonize it. All right, so you've, if it's really far away from the continent, like this first picture, you're not going to have as many species because they're not going to migrate there. If you have a larger island, right, you're going to have more space and more variety of habitat for species to go to. So you're going to have um, uh, higher immigration and higher biodiversity. And the bigger the island, the lower the extinction rate. All right. So we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get uh, together to talk about this. Um, with the idea of fragmentation in mind, when they design a preserve, um, conservationists have to really take a look at how to design that preserve. It's called the SLOSS debate, single, large, or several, small. So do you make one big reserve or do you make a bunch of little reserves? And it depends on the organism you're trying to um, protect. So if you're trying to protect a tiger, right? Tigers migrate, they have huge, you know, tens of square mile territory, 20, 30 square mile territories. The several small uh, preserves are not going to do well for keeping a tiger's population up to protect the tiger because they need bigger areas, right? If you have a bacterium or like a fly or some small species that you're trying to preserve, the several small um, design might be better, okay? So that is chapter 12. I hope you guys enjoyed it and we will talk about it as much as you can enjoy listening to me talk. Um, and we'll talk about it when we get together.